Andre родился в Казахстане. Andre was born in Kazakhstan. He became a millionaire and built an entire city that changes people's lives. People live here for two or three months and then start their own businesses, become more successful. Today you will find out what is inside and who lives within the city for the chosen ones. Why Andre created this project and why a millionaire budgets hamam sanas. If it's possible to make something better in 15 minutes, then you shouldn't buy it on the market. You definitely haven't seen anything like this. First time I encountered a project like this. The world is a race of the best ideas. Let's take a look inside the city for the chosen ones. When I first came to Bali last year, I heard the name Andre from everywhere. This guy Andre, he's doing something. He's building. Who are you? What do you do? I'm an investor, designer, architect, and builder. Let's make a list of projects you created in Bali. Well, I built a lot. I built about 150 villas. 150 villas? Yes, yes. In every street in Ubud, you can see up to three or four villas which are mine, a few resorts. What are resorts? Is it like a hotel? A resort is when you have about 20 villas. A spa complex, a restaurant, yoga pavilions. The idea of park is not to build a resort with 20 villas, but to build a whole region of a city. The project has long been in our minds between two or three partners, my colleagues. Around 2019 we started building it, and nine months later we finished it. Ubud always has these two big groups of residents, who came here for healing or enlightenment, and others who came for business and innovation. At first we thought of making a space where they connect. We are right now in the middle of those two. Yes, yes, but we decided to separate them. So people could pick if at the moment they would like some yoga, and go there, or you need some business, it is here. We have four yoga shallows that we built, and we rent them to yoga teachers. Any yoga teacher can write to you or your team and they can make a free class or activity. Every day we have eight to ten hours of some yoga classes, and maybe three quarters of them are free yoga lessons. Yoga classes in Ubud are more expensive than in Berlin. How is that even possible? Turns out there was no space available. The space was always rented. $100 for one hour of yoga. So I said, let's make the space free of charge, or we take a cut from the fee. But we can't charge $100, in case there will only be a small number of students showing up. Wow, that's amazing. Cool, Marx. People don't need cars, don't need motorbikes, no need to travel around the city or be stuck in traffic jams. You can just live. You can get up in the morning from your loft or villa and walk your children to the kindergarten and then go to the office or go to yoga. How large is the area here? We have four hectares. Four hectares. We have options for more if we want to finish building later, then we have the space. How much was the investment for the project? Well, let's say more than 20 million dollars. At first, when we opened, we had only 24 lofts ready, and they were rented straight away. Just from that, we got 300 to 500 customers per day. I can only imagine what will happen when we accommodate 150 more families. What surprised me the most, you're here every day. You work day and night. You are always in a meeting or in movement. I often see that people relax more and work less. Is this true? I have a theory on this subject. But of course, when people live in Europe or in Russia, for example, there is a certain corset of society, like parents, friends, colleagues, and so on, that hold us back and give us the option only to move in one direction. Well, either up or down, but not to the sides. In Bali, this environment doesn't exist. So everyone does as they please, and when everything is possible, but nothing is needed, then people 
people prefer to do nothing. Tropical islands show people that they either have huge willpower or that they can just lay on the beach like jellyfish. It's true. Yes, yes. And most people don't survive for a very long time in the islands because they can't deal with a situation where you don't need to be doing anything. They have fun as much as possible before they realize that this isn't the purpose of life, and they leave the island. On the other hand, if you have this immense willpower, and you don't need society to direct you towards your goal, then you know where you are going. And then of course the island's very good economic environment because there is little competition and everyone is laying on the beach like a jellyfish. How many years have you lived in Bali? This is the 14th year as a tourist, but approximately 13 years of actively working. Where are you from originally? I was born in Kazakhstan, but as a child moved to Germany and I grew up there. Went to school and graduated from the university. I traveled the whole world, but didn't visit Bali for a long time. At some point in 2007, I sold my company and decided it was time for a break and to de-stress. I just needed a vacation, and I decided to just go find some place where it's good to just be. I came to Bali, and it took maybe two or three days to understand this is a very cool place in a good macroeconomic environment with a great tax situation. There were many good factors that were important for me to stay somewhere permanently. Let's maybe list these factors here, the ones you understood after spending two or three days here. The first president and founder of Indonesia. He loved Germany, so he just took German law and copied it. The legislation is European. The tax system is quite simple, too. Compared to Germany, where we have 50 to 55 percent of just income taxes, and then on top of that, maybe 20 percent of VAT. So if you make a million bucks, you end up with 150 or 200,000. Well, here I would say that if you make a million bucks, you can keep 950,000. So under these circumstances, it is much more lucrative. There isn't as much bureaucracy as in Europe. But the older the economic zone, the more time they had to invent more and more bureaucracy and… Rules. Yes, rules. Like all sorts of rules. If a new economic race began today, and all countries would begin from a reset, then the Western countries would have a difficult time starting, because they have so much bureaucracy, so many licenses, permissions for everything, while these young countries that do not have as many rules allow for the freedom of action. This American dream, from a dishwasher to a millionaire, would be very difficult to repeat in America right now, because there are so many rules and regulations. While in Indonesia, it is quite easy. With a small amount of money, you can build a successful company and quickly achieve success. What can people do here to succeed? Construction and development is definitely a good example. Whatever they want. But actually, development is a complex topic. Whatever they want, quality of life is very high. I was a millionaire in Germany, and I had a housekeeper that came to my home for half a day. While here, I have five housekeepers, a cook and a driver. Imagine if you have $10. When you're in Moscow, that's valued at $5. And in Bali, it's valued at about $100. Basically, add a zero to all your money, and that is your lifestyle here. So if you want to open a cafe in Moscow, you would need, say, $300,000. Here you could open a cafe for $10,000. 30 times cheaper, considering how much competition there is in Moscow, how many problems. Here is little competition and less problems too. If you borrow 300,000 bucks from your friends to open some small cafe in Moscow and you make a mistake, you may never get a second chance in your life. 
Here you can try to open 30 cafes. Here you can try many times. And if you try to open 30 cafes, then definitely at least the third or fourth will succeed. Primarily, it is important to be respectful. The more money you have, the more respectful you must be. You shouldn't ever be a snob who disrespects people. For example, you open some cafe and you tell all your neighbors to back off. I'm better than all of you. I'm cooler. I have more money. This information is very contagious and it spreads in your area. And then the authorities or police or the tax office come and fine you for your disrespect. They have a concept here which is called karma. Someone does something with good intentions, one should not hurt them. They will help you. Even the tax inspection will come and explain how to pay less taxes. Here it is important to listen and communicate. Balinese massage, 250,000 rupees. This is actually more expensive than the market average. Believe me, if you come to, let's say, Four Seasons or to Kempinski, where the massage is $100, 1.4 mil, there's a queue to get there. I explain all of the main lessons of capitalism. There isn't a winner in a race at the cheapest price. Company won't profit, and neither will the client. Because when you optimize by lowest price, the quality may be so bad that the client would also be unhappy. The race is to the best quality. You need to find a suitable balance, price tag, and this is the entrepreneurial activity. And pricing can be one of the hardest things in business. But also, no one is looking at the price. People look for quality and then create an internal price tag. They then compare that internal price tag with a price tag they paid. I only paid $20 for something that was worth $50 for me. This is where success lies. In France, it is often a practice that there is a menu without prices. You come to dine in a restaurant in France with your wife, you get a menu with prices, and she gets one without because you don't want her to choose the food according to the price. You would like her to choose what she wants, right? Ah, yes. This is a very large area, maybe 2,000 square meters, where we built four saunas and two hammams. I've already been here. Oh, wow. Ah, the camera may get foggy. So when I was here, I was told that you created your own stove from the sauna. These are actual door handles. Yes, yes. And basically, this is a handmade, unique design. Because I looked at the market and browsed the stores like Harvey. They're from Finland and are the market leaders in sauna stoves basically like Mercedes, but I didn't find anything suitable. I looked inside the stove and found out that it was just thin stainless steel and welding. And there was nothing professional in the manufacturing. So I thought it wouldn't be stylish to just put any tin bucket. I then researched and found out that it's not very difficult to make a sauna. And now our sauna is unique. It's always important to do something in a more efficient and different way. Doing things like everyone else means ordering something from Harvia. Not everyone can create something better. The design is much better and energy efficient. We just use industrial thermometers. It's always worth taking 15 minutes and thinking a little longer. If it's possible to make something better in 15 minutes, then it's better to not buy what's on the market. Harvey was selling a cubic meter of lava stone to us for about $200. Here we drove 20 kilometers to the nearest volcano and we collected the lava stones for free. So why bring lava stones from Finland? So why bring lava stones from Finland to Indonesia when everything is much easier? What I would love to understand, when you create such a big project here, with a big territory, and spa, and fitness, and co-working, and restaurants, and it is an incredible amount of detail, 
And it seems, from a management point of view, that you have to choose what are the main focus points while you personally choose door handles for the saunas. Because every day there is a new focus, and every day you can pay attention to a new detail. Imagine that a big project is like a train that rides on rails. We always know what we want to build first and what we want to build second. But it's very important to never lose interest. Look out the windows and one day you will be passing the sauna and you will direct your attention to all the details there and create the design. It is logical that all the design is in bronze. The coins? Yes, the bronze, like a lucky charm. So you picked all of those, all these wooden planks, and the lamp? Yes, these plaques and all the design. Often we buy the ornaments or decorations way before the project starts because it is impossible to buy them when you are building. I have a warehouse with things we bought. Here we have to understand what toys we have. For example, five black lamps and an exact number of these mirrors, so we decided they actually belong here. This bar and these walls are made from pallets that were originally used as packaging from the marble we bought. We used a flamethrower to burn the wood from all sides. It is a Japanese technique done so that termites do not eat the wood. It is bitter for the termites. We just burned the dismantled pallets into spare parts and made a very cool bar. Looks quite expensive. Yes, it's pretty cool. Can't believe that these are just the pallets that held the marble. Yes, yes, these are the best materials for which we were given for free. This will be a Russian sauna. It is the most interesting one. It hangs over the river, and it will be a cool space. Yes, let's go in. Ah, construction. This is the way to the Russian bath. We made it this way on purpose, with lower ceilings near the exit. There will be a stove there. For the hot air to go there. Yes, exactly. For the hot air to go that way, and when you open the door, it doesn't cool down. When I came up with the system of the ceiling, I thought to myself, why aren't all Russian saunas built like this? Because actually, if the ceiling is flat, the air comes out. So I thought, since it is a Russian sauna, then we need to buy huge wooden bears and fill the space. So when you enter the Russian sauna, you realize that there are already 30 bears standing in there. <laughs> it would actually also reduce air capacity. <laughs> it was my solution, but then I thought of the ceiling wedge and decided that it will do as well. But I still really like the idea with the bears. Okay. So tell me, when will the construction end? Actually, it is already available to our guests. Is this the Haman? With these dragons? Yes. You choose their design too? Yes, yes, it was me. What I mean is, when will the construction be fully completed? Well, this is a process. Perhaps two or three years later, when I've already built everything and people will already be fully established, then maybe I will deem the project completed. <laughs> However, what you see at the moment is fast development. Yeah, we need to still take care of the details. Yeah, there are so many more details to be adjusted. Yes, exactly. So here's the interesting question I have for you. In Bali, it is common to lease land for 25 to 50 years rather than buy it. So your land here is at least? Yes, it is leased. For how long? Right now, for 32 years. But we have an option to buy all the land. Forever? Yeah. Ah, okay. So homes here have a life expectancy of about 30 years. In 30 years, people argue that it needs a major overhaul or reconstruction to build something new and so on. This means that being attached to something longer already has its difficulties. Right now, my construction aims for these buildings to be in good condition for about 50 to 60 years. It is not necessary to plan for 100 years ahead. No one lives for 100 years. Ha, would love to. No, no, I mean... Well, yes, I understand. I always build in a way that my children will have enough until their retirement. But if you're not sure about the economy of the project, then don't start the project. It's logical. 
But this is exactly where life or business experience comes in. One should always know the budget and profits. And if you don't know, well, let's say you're on a bridge and everyone tells you to jump off this bridge. If you don't actually know how deep the water is, then it's better not to jump. However, the experience of having 50 or 100 companies is that you know the depth of the water. You can estimate and you can confidently jump where others are afraid to. Or you can precisely select the places where to jump. When you know it's 100% win, then you jump. Okay, how is it here from an economic standpoint? How many years do you allow for return on your investment? The return on investment here is pretty good, less than five years. For all investments? Yes, for all investments. I see, yes. So it's the first time I have seen such a project. When you have all the necessities and more in one area, are there any other projects like this in the world? The principle of gated communities that exist in America. A community is built with a few restaurants in the center, a golf club, shops, kindergartens, and so on. Surrounding them are thousands of houses. These are gated communities. However, often these gated communities are closed to the public. Those who do not own a house in that area are not allowed to enter. Areas like this exist in Moscow, too. But I'm not sure that they have shops and restaurants that are available for the public. We also have an option to close up if we have enough traffic on the inside. But now we're open to the public, so anyone can come and use our facilities. The difference between us and others is that in other places the goal is to sell the houses within that area. Whereas here, we try not to sell anything, but rather rent everything, because we would like to control who lives here. Here, we would like to create community guidelines, a social contract that all residents sign, which states that you cannot cause public disturbances, cannot engage in any violence or play loud music, basically not disturb others and live a peaceful life. An interesting part of our project, a part of our residential units will be given as grants free of charge for artists or interesting people who will contribute to the cultural aspects of the community. There. That is dangerous. Children can fall over there. No, no. If you see, we have already built gates over there next to the trees. There's only a meter freefall. But over there, is it pretty high? There's a new fence next to those trees. Oh. I just recently saw a child running, and it honestly scared me so much. I'm exactly the same, arguing with parents who just let their kids go. This is the pool. How long is it? It is 100 meters if you count everything. But we don't take the lagoon into account. Then maybe it is 85 or 80 meters. 100 meters. This is probably the biggest swimming pool in Bali. At least a public one. Yeah, I would build bigger if my partners would allow it. The idea was to build this pool, so it flowed through this building there and then overlooked the river. That was the initial plan, but everyone said, Too expensive? No, actually not expensive at all. But not everyone understands the concept. <laughs> so sometimes I need to compromise. By the way, about your partners, what I heard from those that invested, or the people that you've worked with is that you are very strict with your boundaries in regards to your creative visions. You don't let anyone in, saying that it is my vision, my product, and let me handle it. Yes, yes, because if they knew it better, they would do the development themselves. You don't teach the tailor how to sew, as they say. If I am an architect, they are of other professions, lawyers or marketers, then I let them do their thing, write contracts or sell things. So if I am an architect and a developer, then I logically know the most efficient way. Not that I don't need their opinions, but I have a right to say that my opinion is better and I honestly do my best to listen and evaluate. 
я, я все равно честно стараюсь прислушаться и оценить uh, всегда. Sometimes even the most unprofessional opinion may be smarter than my opinion. Даже самые непрофессиональные мнения могут быть умнее, чем мое мнение. A lot of things here were built because of external ideas. Которые были построены там зубной врач из Киева. For example, the beach right here was an idea which came from a dentist from Kiev. Пляж. Мы сделали пляж. Я, значит, он не строитель, но он просто сказал, а почему не сделать здесь пляж? He isn't an architect, but he just shared an opinion about this beach, and we thought it was a great idea. Very often people ask me, Andre, why don't we do this this way? And then I think to myself, that's actually a wonderful idea, which is much simpler than I thought. It is always important to listen to everyone. The world is a race of the best ideas. About the apartments, how many are in operation already? There are 24 lofts and apartments which are ready and are occupied. But there is a huge waiting list. So now everything is fully booked? Yes, everything's booked. Everyone wants to live here, but it is all sold out. So at the moment, despite the pandemic, no tourists and everything is booked? We have over 200 families on the wait list. For these 24 lofts? Probably for these, the new ones, they've been waiting for a while. Totally understandable. I don't think anyone moves out of here. If they move out, they often sublet to their friends, passing the keys to the so-called friends that will live in their place. But of course we understand, and it's okay, and we change the name of the contract. But basically the idea of the sublet is that no one wants to lose a space here. This shows the strength of a good quality product. Yeah, but really it is all about the community. Everyone who lives here now, or even people who lived and now left, experienced some sort of positive impact in their lives. People who lived here for two or three months and opened new businesses, or they became more successful because this is a positive life experience. Now, out of 24 families that live here, seven of them want to buy their residences. I think we will do a small event and sell the 18 townhouses. We will sell them to our close friends or long-term residents that are part of our community. Okay. For how much are you planning to sell them for? I think it's a completely fair price tag, $179,000. For how many square meters? For about 120, 130 square meters, about $1,500 for a square meter width. $170,000. The resident gets a townhouse in this location, but after 30 years, the property ceases to be there. You must understand that this is a reality for all the houses in Indonesia. When you buy property in Spain, you can buy it for 10 million or 100 million bucks if you buy a whole estate there. After your death, it becomes state property. And you can't pass it down? No. So all states in Spain are bought by limited companies where you are the chief director. For example, your son is listed as the co-director. So when the director dies, the new director takes over. Similarly, in Indonesia, to buy land for the villa you need to spend $300,000. Or you buy land in a villa for 200,000 in the same land and use it for 30 years. I don't think that 30 years later you will be interested in coming here. But within those 30 years, you can, for example, rent this villa. The first five years, there is a return on investment. The next five years, you would double your investment. I don't see a problem here. What I mean is that we can look at all of this from a business transaction point. You also buy a car for a certain period of time. But it's a different asset type. But for real estate, you will receive 20% yearly rent. But a Rolls Royce, for example, you will find very hard to rent out. So I would say that there is business in this. If you divide these $170,000 for 30 years of use, then you get a very small rent, $5,000 a year. And for only $400 a month, you can have an amazing house, built with German quality in Bali. Not so bad. How many events have already been held here? Probably around 200. 200 events? Exactly. What is the percentage of your own events and outside one? 
On New Year's Eve, we were open for four months, and there were more than 100 events, now more than 200. We have days when we have four or five events in one day. We don't count any events in the yoga shala. We're talking about this space here. What if we take these 200 events? What percentage is your own and what is external? Our activities are growing. We can only control what is ours. So if you want to plan success, you must control it yourself. If you want to eat delicious sausages, cook them yourself. How to create a good restaurant? You need a cool space. Give it a name like a baby. This is a vegetarian space. It is an intellectual challenge to create a space where the customer feels comfortable. A heavy metal enthusiast needs a different space than a vegetarian. We create a suitable kitchen for the foods you are cooking and so on. What is this? Champaka. It is a flower of the saints. Did you come up with this? No, it was Rockley who thought of this. Every Champaka flower costs three dollars. Wow! Try it. It's very healthy. It's the flower that Chanel No. 5 is made of. Oh, really? That's impressive. So you have been living here for a while. It may take a few years to finish this project. We will finish this year, I think. And then you mentioned that it will take one or two years until it's refined. No, it won't be the only project. We will build park number two and three. We are already renting 50 hectares in the mountains with the spruce forest, 2,000 meters above sea level. That is park number two. Will it be bigger than here? Well, it will be bigger because the land there is cheaper. So actually you are planning to go further from the ocean? Isn't there Changu or Uluwatu, which are more popular destinations? Changu is for the Australian miners, which like to drink pretty heavily. And that isn't my target audience. If we build near the ocean, it will be in Uluwatu. I already have half a hectare, and all I need is an extra 1.5 hectares, and it will be completed. Uluwatu is more of my vibe. Fresh air, surf, and a view. No drinking miners. Okay, so you will build park two and three. Will you be finished there? The idea of building new parks is not to become a bigger project, but to offer mobility to our residents. They can swap apartments with other residents between the ocean and mountain locations. We can create a platform where people can exchange their apartments and live in different parts of the island. The whole concept of real estate in other languages is immobile, meaning unmovable. But we would love to add this mobility and give people the freedom of choosing where they can live. I would say it is all experience. You have this amazing combination of two things, which one can rarely meet. On one hand, a high concentration on very small details from a pen to a stove handle, and on the other hand, you see the bigger picture of towns and districts. So you see the macro trends. How do you manage to combine these? Because usually people either see the bigger picture of the world, or on the contrary, people dig deep into details. How do you combine this uniqueness? I would say it is all experience. 
There's one Japanese wisdom. Take small things seriously, but larger things with a light heart. Basically meaning that one shouldn't be afraid of big problems, because often the happiness lies in the details. People often fight against the bigger things in life. Like, for example, Don Quixote fought against dragons. But in real life, these bigger problems could just be a perception. And really, they could not be significant at all. The bigger problems are usually things that are so far away, they shouldn't cause any fear. But if the dragon from the story comes so close that you see its scales, then it's definitely time to pay attention. Where are we now? Is this the co-working? This is open-air co-working. Some would like to have AC, and others ask, why do we leave our offices to sit in AC? We try to combine two climate zones because we are all different. How do you understand what they need? So this comes back to seeing things from a different perspective. I pay attention to details because everything consists of small details. Understanding large and complicated concepts is much easier when you pay attention to the details. If you never spent time to consider how a single screw works, then you will never be able to build a bike. We can ask anyone how does an engine work. Not many know, but it is still very interesting. Do you know? Logically, I know. I know how a nuclear reactor works, too, because I am interested to know. But what I mean is that it is part of how we understand the world. If you understand the parts, then you know it better in general. This is the atmosphere that we were talking about. Everyone is doing something, making clothes, making jewelry. So this is also your cafe? Yes, this is our bakery. We observed the quality for four or five months and realized that at one point the counter created huge queues. We decided to separate coffee guys. The main thing is to never be afraid to realize your mistakes. Let's say you had an idea a year ago. So a year later, you need to ask yourself if it is still applicable today. You now have an extra year of experience and therefore you always need to reevaluate. It is better to find your own mistake and fix it before the market or your competitor will find it and fix it. Very often it is one of the most common problems in business. People find a solution and never revisit it again. Everything is temporary, especially in economics. You always have to move and not be lazy. So this is the zone for small events? Yes, this is our small stage, and we have a big one as well. Also, we're now building a big conference hall for 600 to 800 people. Actually, it's ready. We've just been there. This is not a classic co-working space. It's part of the cafe that is actually a free co-working space. If you buy something or use cafe services, you can work here for free. Upstairs, we also have the same area which is a professional co-working space. We haven't opened it yet because of COVID. For right now, it's a primary or middle school over there. But there'll be a proper paid co-working space? Yes, you don't have to buy anything there. Just pick a best place that you like and work. Hello guys, nice to see you. Yeah, yeah. Who are these people? 
These are two very cool designers. Interesting fashion. They specialize in leather. What is interesting about Bali is its fragmented audience. Like you said, the miners. As you described them, they come and go. Essentially the tourists and the others more long-term residents. While you are making a project where you have the biggest conference room and probably the biggest and most modern gyms, and it seems cool because doing everything better than others would lead to more demand, but how did you decide on these numbers? Should the conference hall be for 200, 600 or 2,000 people? Is there really any demand for it? Okay, it's easy to explain. A lot of life lessons actually come from the Bible. When Noah was building his ark, everyone said he was crazy. Why are you building it? Who needs it, they said. There is no flood. He had a vision. Same as in architecture or in projects. You need to first build and then people will come. The main question of capitalism was what comes first, demand or the offer? First the eggs or the chicken? Without a doubt, the answer should always be the offer first. Because demand will come after. This is one of the first rules of Harvard Business School. What comes first, demand or the offer? Some would say, hmm, sometimes this, but sometimes that. No, it's not correct. You cannot have demand for a project that doesn't exist yet. Just look at Henry Ford, who needed a car then. But there was demand for a certain need. They needed to move from one place to another. I read his memoir, and when he asked the people, they asked him to make the horses faster, not even considering a different means of transport. How to understand what offer can create demand? Someone can listen to us now and say, I'll come to Bali and build the conference hall for 10,000 people. But you were always the judge. Noah could have built a little blow-up boat, but he chose to build an ark. The creator writes the rules of the game. How to choose which demand will be in need. We can always depend on our intellect. If I could ask the people before building park, they would tell me to build it in New Sadua. But I knew the expats live in Ubud. We wouldn't want to work with seasonality. Like, for example, in Sochi, they hire people for three or four months and then they fire them. This was before the pandemic, but now the situation is different, either way. What I mean is that seasonality is not profitable, disastrous for economic stability. We don't want to build this for tourists. We want to work with people who value quality and who will come here every day. For example, we didn't even notice that the pandemic started. We didn't notice the decrease in tourists because our customers are long-term residents. But there will be more people when the borders open. Yes, but we have a backbone of loyal customers. There are on average between 500 people. Later there will be a thousand people. Any restaurant, even in Moscow, doesn't profit from tourists. They open up, pump money into marketing, attract 5,000 customers, and from those 5,000, 500 will stay as loyal customers for the next 10 years. 
Those restaurants are not tourist-oriented. Otherwise, they would have to invest big amounts of money every month just for the advertising. And at the end, you find that you spent more money for the ad than you profit on the restaurant. Long-term economic success depends on regular customers. It will never come from short-term tourists. Like, we got lost in the desert, saw your lemonade stand, and decided to come in. You need those people from far away who would run into your stand for the best lemonade ever. Okay, great. Thank you so much for dedicating time to this. You have an amazing space here. Wishing you 10 parks around the world. We will try. Thank you.